As we get into the Schrodinger equation, there are a few things that are worth knowing about the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. One key thing to know is that its solutions are members of Hilbert space, and what is that? I'll talk briefly about that. I usually don't issue disclaimers, but I'm going to issue a disclaimer this time that I am not a mathematician, but they're the things that I found I just need to know concerning this specific subject of Hilbert space. Let's talk about the particle in a box solutions. PIB is my abbreviation, and the particle in a box solutions are, I'm not going to write them out, they're sinusoids, and they have an index N inside the sinusoid, and they go on forever. Let's put down some properties of the set of those solutions. One is that it's infinite. It is an infinite set of functions, that is, it is an infinite dimensional vector space. A second property is that the wave function solutions for the particle in a box problem form an orthonormal basis. Two words here need to be explained, orthonormal and basis. Basis comes in characteristic number three. Let's talk about orthonormal. If I take two different solutions to the wave equation, psi sub n and psi sub m, where m and n are not the same, I get zero. <clears throat> That's the same thing as saying that the integral of psi sub n conjugate times psi sub m dx over all space or whatever space matters, such as the particle in the box, you just have to worry about the length of the box, but zero minus infinity plus infinity is not wrong. The wave function has no value outside the box. So that or some other range of limits. Now this implies something really useful that you're going to employ from time to time, and that is what happens at infinity. The limit as x goes to infinity of the wave function is zero. Just keep that in mind. You'll use it later. Whenever you solve an integral of a wave function using integration by parts, you will use this argument to dispose of the surface term pretty regularly. So this is a trivial statement with respect to the particle in an infinite potential well. Other cases such as hydrogen atom wave functions gradually go to zero as you leave the vicinity of the atom. Another consequence of being orthonormal, that's one consequence. Another consequence is that the inner product of a solution with itself is one. Here's top bracket, is, this, is the ortho part of orthonormal, orthogonal, and the bottom part is the normal part of orthonormal. The functions are normalized. That's what orthonormal means, a normalized set of orthogonal functions. A third property of the solutions to the particle in a box problem is that the solutions form a complete set. Of orthonormal basis functions, that's my abbreviation for function FCN. A consequence of this is that any linear combination of solutions to the particle in a box problem are also solutions to the particle in a box problem. That is also in the space of solutions for the particle in a box problem. The psi sub n are basis functions. They are fundamental. You can't break them down any farther. But the linear combination of these functions is also a solution, but it's not a basis function. That is, it doesn't come directly out of the solution to the Schrodinger equation, but it comes from the argument that you can linearly combine solutions and still get a solution. These expansion coefficients, a sub n, when taken mod squared, they could be complex, are the probability amplitudes that we have been using all along. Here's a depiction, just very um, artistic here. This is not really something that you will want to work with, but hopefully it will help you to see what I mean by a basis set of functions that's orthonormal and that goes into making a solution. So here I have just a line that depicts the solution to the Schrodinger equation, which is a sum. And it is formed from a bunch of bases. So now I'm going to sketch in the 
orthonormal bases. There's actually an infinite number of them, but I need to finish this lecture soon. And so these are your psi sub n, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, and so forth. And they are orthogonal. I cannot depict that in a two-dimensional drawing, but they're functions. And if you took the inner product of one with the other, you would get zero. So like psi 1 has a certain amount of overlap, and that gives you a sub 1. Psi 2 has a certain amount of overlap, and that gives you a2. I didn't depict psi 3 with any overlap, <laughs> but uh, I wish I did. Um, so And so on. Each one of these has some amount of, of uh, projection onto psi. It may be negative. It may be, uh, it may be making psi shorter, or it may be zero, like in the case of apparently psi sub 3. So that's a depiction. That's not meant to be a useful tool. It's just meant to help you to visualize. So the fourth thing I would say about solutions to the particle and box problem then there are a Hilbert space of functions. Because the Hilbert space of functions has all those properties listed above. I'll put it in bullet point. The inner products of the bases can be computed. That is the basis functions. And when you compute it, you get the Kronecker delta function. A second thing that makes me say it's a Hilbert space of functions is that a Hilbert space has an infinite set of orthonormal basis functions. And a third property that we exhibited here is this linear. That is, psi sub 2 is a solution, but so is a times psi sub 2 plus b times psi sub 3. And all these linear combinations are in the space. All of these linear combinations are in the space of functions that solve this problem. So the basis vectors, psi sub n, are only some of the functions in the space. There are a lot more functions in the space because any linear combination of those basis functions are also in the space. So here's a question for you. Are the inner products of the rest of the normalized members also finite? Now, I say normalized, that doesn't exclude any answer because nobody has an expansion coefficient of infinity. But we'll just assume all members are normalized. If so, how finite? And I think that follow-up question gives away the answer to the first question, or I wouldn't be asking it. But if I'm asking is the inner product finite, what I mean is all the other solutions besides the basis functions are linear combinations of them. So the real question is this, is one particular sum taking the inner product with another particular sum, they're not the same sums, is that less than infinity? And just can I prove it? So we can argue that it's less than infinity. I don't really don't have to prove it. The person who proved it is the person who knows how to prove the Schwartz inequality, which says the inner product of two functions, f and g, is less than or equal to the square root of the product of each guy's inner product with himself. That's the Schwartz inequality. And so it follows that because you can always take the inner product of a function with itself and not get infinity, that if, the, if this is not infinite, then that's not infinite. Here, let's work this out maybe in painful detail. Plug in what these things are.
Well, let's just look at the first one under the square root. That equals the sum, I'll say on n, you may as well pull out the a sub n from each, but it's the first one kicks in an a sub n conjugate, and the second one a sub n regular, so I'll say mod squared. And then you're left with psi sub n inner product with psi sub n, which we already know to be 1. So that's just the sum of all of the expansion coefficients. And if it's normalized, that equals 1. We are already um, saying that underneath the radical is 1 times 1. And that then answers the question of how finite. The inner product of two different functions, I'm just going to abbreviate it this way, so that's these two uh, expansions, is less than or equal to 1. If it's in a Hilbert space where all the basis functions are orthonormal and the expansion coefficients have also been determined to be normalized. If the expansions aren't normalized, then it's not less than or equal to 1, but it's still finite. Let's do a little example. Let's consider the function f of x equals x to the a, and I'm going to do this, if x is between 0 and 1 and equals 0 otherwise. What I would like to know, is this in Hilbert space? Maybe more to the point, a has to be looked at. Over what range of values of a is this function in Hilbert space? Well, to answer that question, we really just need to check and see whether or not the inner product is finite. And that is the key issue, is the inner product of this function with itself finite. And what does it take to make that happen? So let's go ahead and get the inner product. The modulus doesn't really matter because it's a real function. So I'll just write that out. That's squared. So that's the function squared. And only from 0 to 1, because it's 0 otherwise. This is where it gets tricky. I look at this, and you know what I want to say? I want to say this equals 1 divided by 2a plus 1. Are you with me on that? Let's be a little more careful, because I don't know what 2a plus 1 is. What if 2a plus 1 equals minus 1? What if it does? Then... I'm declaring that 1 over 0 doesn't matter. Let's write this out explicitly. So you have 1. I'm not going to bother with 1 to the 2a plus 1. Well, I will. That's always 1, no matter what. But you see, if 2a plus 1 is a negative number, I have infinity. So I can conclude that 2a plus 1 must be positive. Or rather, a must be greater than minus one half. And that's my answer to that question. And I'm going to ask you to do a similar kind of consideration for homework. And then we will move on from our treatment of Hilbert space and jump into the Schrodinger equation.